Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's Saddleback webinar. My name is Liz Mangus. I'm a literacy specialist with Saddleback Educational Publishing. While you are logging in, please make sure that you find your control bar. It is at the bottom of your web browser window. I see our number of participants is starting to tick upwards. So at, people are, are logging in, Darina, and starting to join. So for those of you, as you are joining us today, please locate the chat button as well as the Q&A area on the control bar. The chat area is where you will be able to interact with your fellow attendees today. Anytime you want to share a thought, go ahead and put it in the chat area. And please be mindful, there is a drop down menu there so you can reply to all panelists and attendees. Make sure you choose that option of all panelists and attendees so everybody in attendance today can see what you have to say. Now, if you have questions, please reserve those for the Q&A area. That will allow us to uh, get to them more efficiently and more quickly. So if, any, if at any time today you have a question for Saddleback or for our presenter, please use the Q&A area for that today. A lot of you who are joining us always want to know if there are handouts or certificates or that sort of thing, be on the lookout for a link in the chat area for any resources that we have to share with you from today's webinar. We'll get started right at three o'clock Eastern time. And while we're waiting, please go to Twitter. Uh, Saddleback is on Twitter, as is Miss Dorito, Dorina sackman Abwa, who is here today with us. Uh, while you're waiting, please go to Twitter and uh, let everybody know you're joining us for this great learning opportunity today. We're so excited to have Dorina here to share what she did as a teacher with some of these Saddleback materials that so many of you out there uh, have. So let's say hi to Dorina. How are you today, Miss Dorito? Hello, Miss Liz. I am so excited to be here. Hello, everyone. I'm seeing Vivian from Ecuador. I'm seeing uh, Caritha. I'm seeing Keisha from uh, Keller ISD in Texas. This is gonna be so much fun because I want to really show you the teacher viewpoint and I, what I do is I go to districts and I take Saddleback and I say what do you need and we create beautiful content of how to different instruction for your specific specialized ELL students and it's just so fun and it takes a little work but once you get it done and you start to realize the pattern Liz we are going to have so much fun today and I think we're going to empower a lot of people today absolutely oh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm so excited about this. And I'm so excited that so many teachers are joining us today to, to learn and to get some new ideas for what to do with these materials. So uh, yeah, keep, 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 let's keep it going in the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from. I see Jupiter, Florida. I see Oklahoma. I see oh, Esperanza in Carrollton Farmers Branch. Nice to see you. Who else do we have here? Keller ISD. All right. Florida, of course. Long Island. Thank you. Denver, Indiana. Excellent. So we so appreciate you joining us. We know it's very, very busy. Hi, Birdville ISD. Nice to see you. Laurel from Maryland, uh, Kansas. Thank you, Monica, for joining us. We know it's a very busy time and we know it can be difficult to join these webinars during the day. We try out different times and we try different things. Uh, that's why we always um, provide the recording for you 24 hours after the session because we know not everybody can, can um, hop on when we're on live. So we do appreciate those of you who are able to make the time to join us uh, live. Monica from New Jersey. Oh, hi, Monica from New Jersey. I'm glad to see you on here. You know, I almost emailed you directly to make sure you knew about this uh, webinar, but I guess you were, we were just reading each other's minds. So, all right, try to stay very So, who, what else do we have here? Yeah, so many Texans, definitely, definitely. North Carolina, okay. Well, we're getting close to start time, so. Let me go ahead. Oh, Montana. Nice. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, Monica. Monica just got the digital newcomers box. Congratulations uh, for this webinar today. Doesn't really matter if it's digital or print. We've got you. Everything we're talking about today in terms of implementation and differentiation, uh, you are going to be able to find some nuggets of, of, of information and inspiration to, to go ahead and start um, implementing this with confidence. So let's officially get started. Um, obviously, we're here today to talk about implementing and differentiating for welcome newcomers. We know many of you have this box. It's either on your campus. Hopefully it's out and you're using it and not in a closet. 
maybe it's on your campus and, and your, your students are at home and you need some help with that. But either way, we want you to become comfortable with what is in the library and get some good ideas for how it can apply to your specific teaching situation. And that's the reason we invited uh, Ms. Dorina sagman Ewa to join us today because she has used this uh, with students in districts and she has seen great success with it. So um, I'm not going to do a formal introduction to Dorina. I think many of you know her. And uh, if you wanna know more about her, definitely check her out on Twitter and her website, uh, DorinaSackman.com, which we'll show you at the end as well. So you know how to reach out to her. But Dorina, this is, before I jump in and start like talking about what Welcome Newcomers is, did you wanna say a word um, quickly about how you've used this and the success you've seen just so people know where you're coming from? Sure. Hi, everybody. I cannot believe how many people are on here and hello on the chat. I'm going to interact with everybody. Um, I just want you to know I've been doing this with a lot of districts that I serve. I've been teaching for 23 years and took the plunge and uh, now uh, go to different districts and work with them and give them recommendations for newcomer and implementations for their English language development classes, so on and so forth. And with my 12 years experience of doing Saddleback and seeing 78% learning gains, uh, one time I fell down to 62%, but 78% learning gains in my six through eight and nine through 12 in my experience. And I also did that in Massachusetts. It's not just in Florida. It was something I had to share. So please understand this is coming from a teacher's perspective of how to use it. And what I love doing is taking everything that you have, because all I see a lot of times is, oh, we buy this, we're excited, and then it sits on a shelf. Right? We look at it, we're overwhelmed. What, what, is, this, what is this teacher guide? This, this, these books are too difficult. No, they're not. If we can discuss how we can use the books on what I call level A, Bs, and Cs, so we can figure out our kids, the levels for you know the beginning, intermediate, and emerging bilinguals, we can do this together to make this program, which I call the less is more attitude. And more than ever, we need less than less is more. It's really the quantity over the quality. And so sometimes people see it and they're like, what am I going to do with this? There is so much if we just go beyond what is right in front of us. But even if you're a new teacher and you focus on a scope and sequence of what is in front of you, it'll still work. And in these times with we hybrid face-to-face -face or in um, digital learning, of course, less is more is the key. And this is why I'm so big on this. So I cannot wait to give you all the samples and strategies that I've done. And if you stick around, you could actually get an entire lesson plan for one of the units that you can use as a guide. So let's get started and do it. Back to you, Liz. All right, let's do it. It. I want to start off today, actually, Darina will, and I will be going back and forth. I know many of you are used to me turning off my camera and my microphone and just turning it over, but you're stuck with me today. So uh, Darina and I will be partnering on this. I want to start off today by um, kind of giving you an overview of this library for those of you who have it and just maybe haven't really investigated it very much, but also for those of you who are joining us who maybe don't have it and you're just trying to, and you're just here because you're curious. So actually this is a good um, point to do like an informal poll. So let's go to the chat area. And if you could let us know in the chat, which category do you fall into? Do you have this library and use it? Do you have it and uh, you're not using it? And if you're not using it, what's the obstacle there? Um, or are you here just because you're curious? So, so where do you fall? Okay, we have um, Justine uses it. Okay, Monica starting with the first book, American Culture. Okay, a couple people are here to learn, curious. Okay, uh, some people are looking at their options. Okay, have it and use it. Okay. Good. Cur yes. Learn more. Okay. Looks like it's a good mix of curious and have it and just trying to get better at it. Um, trying to get better ideas in between T. Oh, okay. Jody's got a specific situation there. Yeah. Yeah. See, Sandy said it's too hard for newcomers. I hope you get something out of this, Sandy. And definitely we can chat afterwards post uh, to show you how really it isn't. It's just we can make this work for all kids. And Liz is going to surprise you with the actual opportunity to have some books that are just below the newcomer level too. Right, Liz? Mm -hmm, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I have one more question for everybody. Is anybody in a situation where you have the books and you are teaching in person with your student, but you can't distribute the books, like because the kids aren't supposed to be sharing the books. Is anybody in that situation? 
a yeah. few of you. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We've been hearing that is um, a, a common theme. Like I have the books and my kids are in school in person, but as a, as a, a COVID precaution, perhaps we're, they're not actually allowed to, we're not allowed to distribute the books. So, so that's an interesting situation to, to be in as well, but we're, we like I said, we're going to help you out. So um, because we have a combination of people and there are quite a few people here who are just here out of curiosity, uh, bear with me while I kind of give an intro to these materials. So pictured on the screen, you see um, kind of um, what's in the box, so to speak. And I'm hoping what you're noticing is, wow, hey, there's a, there's a lot of books in this box. Yes, there's a lot of books in this box, 28 titles to be exact, three copies of each one if you have the, the print. Also in the box um, itself is the teacher's guide and a box of survival vocabulary cards, which will be uh, integral in, in how Darina shows, how, shows us how um, we can use these materials. Now, these are topic-based books for teen newcomers. These are the 14 topics that are covered in, uh, through the books in the library. So we have quite a number uh, of topics here, everything from weather and natural disasters, to community services, to money basics, to school basics. So really these were designed to share critical information that a newcomer needs to become comfortable in the United States as their new home. Now I mentioned earlier there are 28 books we have 14 topics. So for every topic, you're going to have two books, two books. Uh, and that is actually quite nice because those two books are actually paired text, nonfiction and fiction. So let's kind of zoom in a little bit and take a look at some of these books. On this screen on the right, what you see are a couple of examples of book pairs, uh, one for the school basics topic, uh, which will cover the key aspects of school basics. And then it's fiction counterpart, which is bus 17. And on the bottom there, we have another example of the transportation topic, the nonfiction book covering the key aspects of transportation, as well as its fiction counterpart, which is called found. Now in the box, we're also going to have that teacher's guide, which gives us lots of different activities and ideas, plus those survival vocabulary cards. And we're going to talk about those more in depth as we go along today. Here's an overview of the 14 nonfiction titles that we have in this library. And for our purposes today, we are going to be focusing on school basics. Darina is going to show us how she would launch and differentiate a unit around school, the topic of school basics. Here are all the fiction counterparts to the books we saw on the previous screen. Um, I'm hoping what's jumping out at you here is uh, the degree of representation, uh, as my colleague Jill likes to say, we have main characters in these fiction books that uh, hail from all continents with the exception of Antarctica for obvious reasons. Um, and for today's purposes, we will be focusing on that school basics fiction book, which is called Bus 17. Let's take a closer look at the interiors quickly, just to, um, what I'm doing here is I'm setting Dorina up so that she can talk about how she would um, launch these lessons. So what you're looking at here are the insides of these two books here, Bus 17 and uh, School Basics. What you see here is great photo support. So the students, maybe they don't know a word that's on these pages, but they can see the pictures and the pictures tell them something. And that is definitely something you can utilize in your instruction. The other thing I'm hoping that jumps out at you is that vocabulary is called out clearly, bolded, and it's bold. So that's a text feature right there that you can uh, talk about. And it's also defined right there on the page for you. So uh, we're going to get to why that's important when we start talking about reading these books. I just want to address before I go to the next screen, let's take a look at these Lexile levels here. The bottom of the screen shows you that the Lexile range for this collection is 150 to 290. And um, you may be feeling like that's a little too high for newcomers, uh, but it has its advantages. Having a text level like this has its advantages and Darina will share with us how we can help unlock this text for our students who, who um, might have interrupted education or might have some gaps. Um, so we're still going to show you how these books are still usable uh, no matter what level your students are at when they come into your classroom. The survival vocabulary cards um, are a huge uh, 
bonus when it comes to these books because you can really use them to kind of front load and start giving your students some access to some of the language that they're going to find in the books. Some key things you need to know about the vocabulary cards. We have 10 words per topic. The same 10 words are going to appear in both of these books, in both the nonfiction and the fiction. So when you teach these vocabulary words, no matter which one of these books that the students pick up, they're going to be able to identify those words uh, and that's going to help to them to start building their understanding. In the books themselves, you have the, uh, the, the there's a glossary and then the, the words are called out clearly and defined on the same page or the same spread. And the vocabulary cards, of course, uh, will, will match the words for each topic. And the, the, the word is on one side with a nice student-friendly definition and then some nice photo support on the other side. And then finally, I'm gonna give you a sneak peek into the teacher's guide, just a, just a sneak peek, because we're gonna get into it in depth um, in a little bit. But many of you who have this, if you haven't really looked at this teacher's guide, you should really take a good look at it because you're going to find something in there that is going to inspire you and get you going when it comes to teaching these materials. And one of the things I wanna point out is we have several different student activities for each topic and each book in these teacher guides. And the, one of the things you're going to find is that there's always going to be a graphic organizer of some sort uh, throughout the teacher's guide for each topic. What you see here is, is a web. So uh, in this case, for the nonfiction title in, in this collection, we're using a web. Um, and so you're, because of the fact that there's always going to be a graphic organizer involved, uh, that is um, sort of a common thread that you can weave through your differentiation. And so that's a good starting point for you. And this is just another example. This one's from American Culture. Again, what you see here is a web. So between the vocabulary cards and knowing that graphic organizers are sort of an integral part of what's presented in the teacher's guide, you can put these two things together and you can start launching your differentiated lesson. So Darina, let's say I wanna start my unit on school basics. Um, I, have to, I have these two books here. I have my, my vocabulary that I want to teach. What do I do with these books? Especially if I feel like they're a little bit hard for my kids, how do I start this? Well, one of the first things we have to do is front load, front load, front load, front load. That's it. Front load, front load. We all know about activating schemata and making sure that we have that, you know, information first before we go into the text anyway. I display these texts always, either I'm constantly having this behind me if I'm digital or in face to face, I will always have them present. Kids can always peruse it anytime they want to, but at the same time, this is how I would front load. We take the vocabulary cards that we just discussed and you can see them behind me as well, right over here. And I put the vocabulary cards. Now I'm gonna do a face to face example, but can also be done brilliantly on Jamboard and Jamboard is done very well. You can do the entire thing the same way where I do gallery walks. And the gallery walks are really great because you have the students looking at the cards and the cards are individually around. I put them all together right here first, just for the interest of the actual graphic of um, being in a, on a webinar. But the pictures would be around and underneath them, you would see this guide and sentence frame. Now, if you're comfortable and you know, and you have good language ability to say, okay, I can, I understand the word I see, I can fill that out. Well, then you would take your notebook and fill it out, digital or regular. But I can also say in the picture, there is or are, but right now, this is what we're just gonna focus on. Level A, the beginning, the newcomers, all I want, if they can't say the word, because you know the words are behind you, but on the other side are the pictures. Right now, all I want them to tell me is what do they see in that picture? This is level A, what do you see? Because right now, if it's difficult for them, if they wanna do it orally as I'm walking around with level A, because level B and C will be doing something different, then I can see that the kids are being, okay, I see school, I see tree, I see lady, right? And then that's what I work for. That's all I want right now. And this is the thing we have to understand. We have to go to the level of the child. They are still equitable education lessons because they're doing the same thing as everybody else, but on the level of the kid. And they're gonna feel so empowered once they're at the point of what they're able to see. But now if we go to the next one, right, Liz? We're gonna go into something of what they see. And as we go to the next slide, 
you can see, and this is thinking maps, and if anybody has thinking maps in their district, and thinking maps gave us um, the permission to use it, as you can see it's referenced, which is a wonderful way in which you can actually have the cognitive and metacognition and the thinking of children, the eight major ways in which they actually understand and really put things down on paper. And really, I'm a huge thinking maps fan, and although there's no frame of reference around it, this again is the bubble map, where the child would then, in each card, we would give the term and then they would tell me what they see. Now I know it says adjective, but you know, don't tell thinking maps. I'm gonna do it a little bit differently where they see it. So because we practice it in the, the walk, the gallery walk, now what did you see? Put in the words. So there's that one vocabulary word and then what they see. Did they do their content objective for the day? Yes, their language objective was to write it and to say it. Did they do that at the end of the day? Yes, boom, they're done. This is what I want them to feel empowered. It's called the Kumon effect. Sometimes it might be a little bit easier than where they are, but that empowers them to go, I think I might be able to be ready for B. But this is what the level A kids and the newcomers and the beginners are able to do. And if they can't do it themselves, you do it for them and it's okay. And if it's still difficult, but they can do it orally, this is when we start introducing the phonics aspect of things. But this is what you would have for level A. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so now here's level B. And now if we circle this one, this is again, we're kind of introducing in a very subtle passive way, how we would do writing. In the picture, comma, see how I'm going like this? I hope you're all doing this in your own screen. In the picture, comma, and you're really making those conventions as well as the writing. Prepositional phrase in the picture, comma, there is R in betting grammar. And then the person in level B will tell me there are this, there are students, there is a school. They will focus on their, their grammar conventions as well as what they see as well, but they also should be using in the picture, there is a, and they will guess from the vocabulary. And their responsibility would be doing that. In face-to-face, -face, they would actually be walking together. Now, some people say, well, you should do heterogeneous. For front-loading, I'm doing homogeneous. And you would front load with level A's walk together, level B's walk together, level C's walk together. So they all discuss. Then when we all come together, that's when we mix it all up. So if level B, if they have the capacity to do IC, then they go, of course, to they have to prove that to me in a formative assessment. They can go on to the B. In this picture, comma, there is, there are. And they fill this out. We haven't even looked at the books yet. Not at all. But they're kind of telling their own story and making a connection. Going to the next slide. And in this slide, you can see again, using thinking maps, but instead of just doing level A, which they are required to do a bubble map of specifically the school, let's just use that as an example of a vocabulary word, the school in the nonfiction book that they see and the school that they have. This is where I'm now introducing compare and contrast. Now they can peruse through the book in their groups and they can also look at some of the pictures and in the book what school what can you say that is different from the school aesthetically or not and we can use that in our academic language what is similar to it and this is all we're asking to do we're not putting it into writing yet we just want them to be able to decipher now what did we do we just did two standards understanding compare and contrast and we also understood the difference between fiction and nonfiction. and we're also recognizing media and text we can know what is highlighted, what's italic, topography. Those are three or four standards already that's required in an ELA. So now if we go to level C, and this is all just thinking maps at this point. This is all we're front loading it with for them to get all the vocabulary. And they would discuss it face to face or broken into groups in, um, in hybrid or in digital learning, they would have a card that you would actually have digitally. You would, the random selection of the card, the students would then have discussions using sentence frames. And that's when you can break into groups and say to each other, what do you see? Okay, in this picture there is, what do you, and have, and of course encourage first language or heritage language. Now in level C, this is my favorite because they have to pass A and B to get to C. And once I see they're comfortable with B, they would then go into, according to the book, comma, quotation. What are we doing? Prepping them for what? Prepping them for writing when they have to cite 
nonfiction articles. As every state knows, and I still don't know why we're having standardized testing in the middle of a pandemic, but I digress, they're half to preparing themselves for writing. So we're preparing as they're focusing on, according to the text, comma, and according to the book, comma, basic skills, now, should it be actually quotation or should it be underlined? Because actually an article is in quotation, but a book is underlined. And those are the ways of the total physical response that we teach kids. And then they would answer those questions. Of course, there's a word bank down there, but any way that they want to cheat, they can cheat. Why? Because it's front loading, right? And then what do we do, Liz? We go back to thinking maps here. Exactly. And this one is a little more complex. They've got to prove they can do one bubble map. They've got to prove they can do compare and contrast. And they've got to do two different pages now. So they just, I'm sorry, two different uh, cards. So they can do the school or they can do the principal. They can randomly choose it and they can do this in a flip grid. They can do this in Jamboard. They can do this in their own presentation. They can do it orally. They can make me a video. They can text me. They can smoke signal me. I don't care whatever they do, as long as they can show me that they have the capacity to compare and contrast, do a contrastive analysis on the person in the books and the person uh, in real life. And this is either when we're doing nonfiction or fiction. So they can do it based on the picture or based on the character, but they have to be ready for that. And so I'll challenge level C in this way, okay? And then what happens next, Liz? We're going to talk about your word wall back there. And then I wanna actually circle back around and kind of um, reiterate all the things that you just said. So, because that was a lot of information. So um, this is your word wall. And um, there's something special about this because it's uh, like a, a T chart, it's a two column chart. So, so what's going on here? Well, one of, my one of the biggest uh, challenges of second language learners and students who are acquiring the English language, not just learning, of course, is the fact that they're losing out on academic language literacy. So school is fine. But yet when they're in the midst of taking an article to exam or an, uh, a standardized test or they have to be college and career ready, they're missing out on the academic language that is really hindering their growth and they become uh, the student who really knows what's going on but they wind up being a level one instead of a level three. I can't stand numbers but you understand because they're lacking the larger words. But why would we not put this immediately in their heads to see? So on your walls, whether it's digital or face to face, you would have a social or academic, a social word or academic word wall. So the social word is the words that, you know, pretty much that we would say school. But what's another way of saying school? Educational institution. Now, who would do this? The level C babies. And why? Oh, I have to look at the screen. The level C babies. And the level C babies would be doing this because they would be finding out synonyms and they would be finding out the opposite of synonyms, the antonyms, they would be creating this, we would check it, we'd make it together, and then they teach B and C. And I'm sorry, B and A. And this is how it really becomes part of the students. This is not just a wall I create, this is where the students create this wall. And then we encourage them to use different ways of seeing this. And I encourage showing little excerpts of articles and paragraphs that have those words in it. And this is a very powerful piece to retain the social vocabulary word because they're also seeing academic. And when they use it, you praise them and it is just so wonderful. So this is pretty powerful. So Liz, you wanted to circle back because I know that I talk like a Tasmanian devil on a double <laughs> espresso, but I really just wanted to make sure you understood the importance of, see the visuals back here? They're a must when you're doing digital. And we have the pictures on the opposite side with the cards. The pictures are always there. Uh, when I have my breaks and I have the kids um, digitally, the pictures are constantly being done. You know how you have them like a jiffy and they're constantly being thrown? Oh my gosh, it is just fantastic. So definitely, definitely. And Monica, come, let's have coffee together. So Liz, <laughs> let's talk about this and uh, where you wanted to just kind of reiterate everything that was going on. Right, because uh, obviously we've been working on this for a long time. And so I already knew what you were going to say, but I think it's worth repeating that we haven't even read the books yet at this point. <laughs> um, so, so those of us who are in a situation where you're kind of like, well, um, I can't exactly pass out the books or I don't have the books or I don't know what to do with the books. You can do all of this really uh, without the kids having their hands on 
the books. Um, so this is a lot you can do to, to start teaching language with, without, without even necessarily cracking open the book for a guided reading lesson at this point. So I just wanna go backwards here for a second. Yeah, and, and I think, Liz, when you were saying that, one of the big things is when you have this and you have, you contracted and you purchased the items, it's imperative that you know when you have those items, Saddleback is being extremely understanding and saying, we know that you have to survive in some way. So when you have those cards, and you're going to see in some of the ideas for the lessons that I've done, I've taken the cards and snip tooled it and made it into that. But I know it's only for my kids because it's not, you know, we're talking about intellectual property here. We're talking about licensing here. But I know that Saddleback, when I asked them permission, they said, yes, if you're just using it for your kids, you can have those cards. And then I create those flip cards myself and I put it digitally and it is constant and it's beautiful. And the kids get to tell stories using those vocabulary cards before we even got to this. And it's really exciting. So these thinking maps uh, were the compare and contrast the, uh, the, the students are using images from the book, like perusing the book and, and getting information that way um, to, to fill this out. Is that right? Well, this is, this is pre, we haven't even read the books yet. We're getting information from looking at the pictures from the vocabulary cards or flipping through the books, kind of doing a preview of the books. Right. And that's, you know, again, this is asynchronous, but with synchronous, I actually, if they want it and at their recommendation, I will always use the doc cam. I'll use that, you know, the mirror image and I will do this digitally and I will go through this entire thing by just, again, Emily Francis does this really great with front loading is that you actually just take a look at the pictures and have discussions based on the pictures and match that with the vocabulary and let them tell their own stories. But right now I just use both books to just show pictures to balance the vocabulary, but we're not even reading the story yet. Why am I looking at myself? We're not even reading the story yet. So this is really exciting stuff. And that's okay. really how you can do it. And Monica even said she uses Quizlet to front load. And there's many different ways. So the more people have any suggestions, throw them in the uh, comment section for other people to get inspired. I'm kind of doing old school meets new school because mm -hmm. some of you are face-to-face -face, and I wanted to make sure that I put that both together. So this is a perfect time to circle back around to this, which is, this is these are, as I like to call them, the stats on the books in the Welcome Newcomers Library. Again, let's circle back to that readability level and that Lexile level. Uh, 1.6 through 2.5, if you're looking at readability level, Lexile level of about 150 to 290. So um, those of you out there who may be in the camp that these feel a little bit hard for your students, uh, think about the front loading that um, Dorina just did, uh, where we're, having, we're doing all this work around language and vocabulary, we haven't even gotten to the books yet. Mm -hmm. um, so once, once you do this front loading in these activities where the students become familiar with those 10 vocabulary words per topic, when you crack open the book, there's 10 words right there that they should be able to identify. And that's going to get you get you going on that. And also just notice the, the page count uh, on these books. These are not, for those of you who don't have these books and haven't actually held them in your hands, uh, they're 64 or 48 pages, depending on whether it's the fiction or the nonfiction. These are not baby books. These books have some weight to them. So these are, um, these are really good quality books. When you pick them up and you hold them in your hands, they, they feel like a good, uh, a good heavy book. So um, just a little tidbit of information um, for you on these books. I think okay. that's the big thing about that, Liz, is that people say it's too hard. I have to go back to my first grade, second and kindergarten books. Um, imagine what we want to do to advocate for our ELLs. And as a teacher who understands that, there's a lot of books that I can use. And I can even go back to school to do the Clifford books and all the books that help with our grammar and composition and uh, grammar and our structure of, of understanding. There are ways in which, and as you know from recent research, that even Lucy Calkins and her program, we can't, it's, it's really great, this, this debate that's going back and forth about phonics, not phonics, this and that. For English language learners, Sife's Slifes with Interrupted Education, those babies do need phonics. And in our classrooms that we had the most success with that, with our level A babies, is that we had the exact equitable education of the same exact book using strategies we just discussed and then phonics going back to this in a writing piece and then phonics and I'm a huge proponent of phonics for interrupted education and and that's one thing that would be a perfect balance for this and again the less is more really helps with those kids because again it's the quality not the quantity of work 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 it's getting it done to empower them to see the words so that they can get to that next level 
Absolutely. All right, let's keep it going here. Okay, so we've taken a look at the books. We front loaded the vocabulary. We're getting ready to read. But before we do that, let's take a look at the teacher's guide so you become familiar with it and you know what's in there because this is going to be um, your, your foundation, so to speak, of some different activities and things you can do with your students. Um, the teacher's guide uh, is going to give you, uh, as Darina says, your basically your level B activities and then you have to take it up a notch for your C's and down a notch for your level A's. Let's take a look at all the stuff that is in here because it's a lot of cool stuff. You're going to have lesson plans for every topic. We're going to have activities that are broken down into like partner, small group and whole class activities. This is not a scripted curriculum. You don't have to do all of those things. We just like to give you lots of options. We also give you lessons and activities incorporating the cards. And after you front load it in the way that Darina has described, these additional uh, activities are, are great extensions on helping kids uh, kind of internalize that vocabulary. And then you have those reproducible student activities that I gave you a sneak peek of uh, back a few minutes ago with the graphic organizers. And you're also going to have quizzes. So you have a lot of, you have a lot of material right here in the teacher's guide. Let's take a closer look at them. First, you're going to have the topic introduction. This is basically like your unit intro, right? This is, it gives you some ideas for how you can build background knowledge uh, for your students before you even get into the book. These are things you can bring in from outside the classroom to kind of help build that background knowledge. And that is brilliant to give to your level Bs and level Cs as a synopsis to front load as well. And they actually, we make movies out of them. You know, you do the previews, we make movies out of them. And it says, coming to a theater near you. And it's at school basics. This book begins with an overview and the kids actually practice their oral skills by being a, someone who does a preview for movies and they create them on iMovie. It is so much fun for fiction and nonfiction. Just so you know, the little things that you gotta think outside the box of what is given to you in that newcomer uh, teacher guide. And then we've got the lesson plan. Again, this is where you're going to find different ideas for small group and partner activities, and also um, a little, a little tips for preparing to read and, and reminding you to preview that book. Um, but if you've already front loaded all that vocabulary, that's just going to be a couple of minutes of your time to really preview that, uh, the, the book before you get into the actual content of the book. And then you have a page which is strictly vocabulary. It's going to give you ideas on what to do with those cards and extra lessons and activities. Again, these are going to be uh, great extensions or uh, great other things that you can give your level B and C students while you're kind of working with your A student, uh, level A students or however you need to do it. So the fact that we have so many different activities and lessons and small group, whole group, partner, that gives you lots of different um, choices that you can then modify depending on uh, which group of students you want, you need to work with. Yeah, and it's a, it's a great point that Valentina brought up too, that there's no script, you have to follow the child. And it is very powerful because even if you're a brand new teacher and there's a lot going on and you're looking for something for, and you have a specific sheltered instruction ELD class or ELA class with all ELLs of varying levels, even a brand new teacher, you could follow it as a scope and sequence and you would still see gains following it that way. But we all have to think outside the box and teach to each individual child and say, well, we might not do that, we might do this. And that's what makes it so powerful. And the next lessons are gonna show you that, right, Liz? That's right. So. Let's now say we're ready to get into these books. I've done my vocabulary. I've combed through the teacher's guide. I've picked out a few of those things to kind of work with my students to build background knowledge. Now I'm ready. Let's, let's get into these books and start reading these books. I wanted to give you a close up view of the interior of, of the nonfiction and the fiction titles. So I'm hoping what you're noticing here again is the, uh, the vocabulary that's highlighted. Remember, we, we talked about all that work you do to front load that vocabulary. What about my students who I feel like this is too hard for? We've already taught that word principle and worked with that word principle in a variety of ways. And Darina, how many times does the word principle appear on this, on this page? One, two, three, four, four times. So the kid can notice it. <laughs> so yeah, and, and that is, that's one word that I now know that I can start 
using and, and working with, uh, with, this, um, with this particular book. Uh, let's take a look at the uh, fiction now. What do we see here? Again, that vocabulary is called out. That's a word that the, your students should already know at this point, just through pre-teaching. But also now I see we have some dialogue in here. So one of the key things about these books being written at the level that they are written at is that this allows you to actually start approaching and teaching some of those standards with, uh, with these books. And I know, Darina, you wanted to talk about how these, these are standards aligned. You can teach standards with these. And that's why we ha really have these big close-up pictures of the pages for Darina to talk to you about uh, what standards you can actually teach with these books. Yeah, and one of the biggest things that I love doing with these books, even digitally or even remote, is when you do have access of, as we said, you can take the book, you can bring it close. Oh, that's upside down. That wouldn't work. And you would take the book and bring it close to a doc cam. And you could go into doing the asynchronous work when A's and B's are working or C's. All your students, let's say you're working with your B group now, and these babies, you have, uh, who do you have? You have a narrator, you have characters, and you create your rising action, your plot, the whole nine yards, and you put that whole thing together as you're discussing with your group and they all read individually in breakout groups and they learn how to do their own dialogue, which is great. The other thing you can do with level A, if this is still too difficult, and this is my favorite thing to do, face to face, I put post-it notes over it so they couldn't see what the dialogues were they created their own. So like Liz, if you wanted to go back to the nonfiction one real quick, I just wanted to show you, you before we go into standard. You see how that man who looks like if Pharrell and John Legend had a baby, this man right here, who's your principal? This guy <laughs> right here, he is in fact, that would be blank. And you ask your children to say, what is he saying? Who is this? And they go principal. And then what is he saying? Hi, I'm principal. Whatever it is, they're communicating that that's the principal. And you do the who, what, when, where, why, and how. And that's all you have to know for this book. So with fiction and nonfiction. And then they progressively will begin to understand through their vocabulary. So this is really great. And if we want to go look a little bit at the standards, I can explain to you how I design all of these for districts around the country and in Puerto Rico for, in fact, people who use newcomer, but they're like, well, it's not standard aligned. Take a look, take a look at this academic vocabulary, analyze and determine. And by the end of even one book, the kids will know the standards for fiction and nonfiction. Take a look just real quick of those. These are actual things in which you have. And they say, well, how does the first one really work? because it's a work of literature in the United States. And then we do a contrastive analysis with an article or a story from outside, bringing in the cultural responsiveness of the children's cultures. And that's where that one is done. Better than any class you can say, that ELA class, bam, you can put that in there and it's really powerful. So take a look again at the other standards of nonfiction, because I know we only have a few minutes. So do we have that nonfiction one coming? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, there's a delay on my phone, I apologize my side. Do you see it? Uh, nonfiction. Here it is. So again, we have determine and analyze, integrate and evaluate. Listen to this academic language we're doing. Sure, this is the one that you have that is responsible for you. I took this as the general standards of pretty much, but your own particular state standards. And you would put this into social language for children, as we all do for our standards, for putting in the content objective and, of course, the language objective if you follow SIOP model. Um, but what is really important about this is that this is really what goes on in nonfiction books. These books right here are exactly what it is. So you don't need Beowulf right now, or you don't need to have a nonfiction uh, this contrastive analysis of the Galapagos Islands and Antarctica. And when it comes to um, penguins, you know, in this ridiculous complex text, they're doing the same standards. That's equitable education based on the linguistic a a a level that they can do at this point. And then you expand once they expand. And of course, if you're a WIDA state, matching up with your WIDA descriptors, it's a beautiful thing. So I love all these ideas that Monica's putting on, and this is just so great. So definitely, you have to ask yourself when it comes to when you prepare things for your newcomers, are you standards based? It is, you should be because it's going to give you the gauge of how much these kids are gonna master. And a lot of these babies can master these standards in their first language anyway, right? In their heritage language, right, Liz? That's right, absolutely. Monica, I saw you posted a question there 
uh, earlier about the front loading the vocabulary. It, in that vo vocabulary, really on any of this, Darina, um, if, if I have a student um, at home, I have two students uh, joining me from home. One is intermediate, one is, um, one is level B, one is level A. Um, any suggestions for, for that? I would, uh, personally, I would try to give them both, um, both students the, the, the same sentence stems and have them work together, but that, that's me. What do you think? I would too. And uh, you assess them first to see how well they're doing. Find out if they both share heritage language. If one is stronger than the other, obviously. One of the things that a misconception is that, oh, we can't have kids teaching kids. Okay, when the child has mastered something, what happens? You teach it and it actually helps them retain the information. We're not saying for them to constantly interpret or translate on paper or do any, we're not saying that. We're saying have a dialogue and let one who is stronger, it's that L plus one. It's why you don't do homogeneous and you do heterogeneous. So when you have a level A and a level B together, that level B becomes maestro. And that's exactly what's important that the kid teaches, but then then level A has to teach level B, whether it's in heritage or in English. And then I, boom, give them something with a little more challenging for the both of them. And the balance of that is very good and allow that to happen. But if you find engage yourself, if the level B baby is kind of just, it's a little too easy for them, that's when you have to say, I, I got to challenge you even more. This is teaching to the child, not the actual curriculum. And that's the beauty of what you can do when you interact with two kids at the same time with different levels. It's my favorite thing to do anyway. <laughs> I love that. Okay, let's, let's bring it back. Let's tie it in. All right, just to recap, we front loaded the vocabulary. We are starting to look into the books. We're starting to read the books. We're tying in some of those standards. In your teacher's guide, you also have these guided reading questions. Let's not neglect these, okay? These are a great resource. It tells you on which pages you can stop and which questions you can ask if you wanted to use them while you're working with, uh, with a group of students. But as Darina pointed out to me earlier today when we were talking, these are all, actually, they're right there for you in the teacher's guide. You can actually uh, take these and provide them to your levels B and C students for them to do on their own or in partners uh, as well. So these are a nice resource to have um, while you're actually uh, having your students engage with the books. Um, and, and before I jump over to the next slide, I wanted to see if you had anything to add on this, Darina. Yeah, that's it. And I would break it down, you know, less is more. So if we're just doing a certain amount in a certain section, I wouldn't do the whole thing. But some of the kids might want the whole thing and you just hand them that, that this ditto, excuse me, I'm aging myself here. <laughs> Weird. Not I'm this only... one. This one has the answers on it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You don't want this one. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> But the funniest part is that it could have the answers, which leads to discussion. So there's another way in which you can do it, but you're absolutely right. You kind of got to redo that just a little bit, but there's other ways in which you see the answers and then they have to have and re in, improve the dialogue because it's very straightforward of guided reading, but then you can expand saying, okay, well, do you have charter schools in Mexico, in, you know, Hidalgo? And if, if you do, no, you don't. Oh, okay. But in Okasha, you do. Oh, wow. So there's different ways that you can have these conversations and expand and make it relevant to the student where they're connecting to the content. And even maybe having one of those quick, you know, real true thinking, thinking questions. I keep stepping with the screen. So, and the other thing is, is that you want, of course, break it into the nonfiction and the fiction. And my favorite thing to do is one section of kids gets a fiction first and the other section gets the nonfiction and then they teach each other. So they all were in groups in fiction and nonfiction and now you break into, into groups with one fiction kid, one nonfiction kid. Now they got to teach each other. Mm -hmm. And you know, you might get the copying kids. Well, that's how you assess the information and you could see if they're really engaging in that dialogue. You jump into those conversations. Perfect. Now I do want to take a minute to address the actual guided reading. So when I am sitting with my student, either in a physical classroom or with a synchronous lesson over the computer, what, what do I do with these books? Like, especially what, what do I do that's different with um, a student who is a level B versus a student who is a level A when it comes down to, to me, the teacher, guiding them through this text. What does that look like? 
Yeah, and so basically you want to first look at, we'll look at level A first. And we were trying to actually find the pictures of my students that I did last year working on this because they were so diligently working, but um, I, I'll hopefully be able to show that on Twitter at some time. But um, basically if I'm going to work 100% with my level A's, we go on the basis of the IC and the recognition of all the 10 words what that we front loaded. Um, the other thing that we also do, and a lot of times that I will take is I will take this vocabulary just like Jody talked about with re-wordify. Re, re re-wordify breaks down language to assist kids and that's a wonderful wonderful uh, uh, thing that you can use technology that you can use that breaks down the language to make it more understandable for the kids without saying that this is too difficult for them. Wonderful technology but the other thing that you can do as we've done in so many times is that the story can be told fiction or non-fiction based on what they see. And this is all I would do with level A's, all I would do. It really, really helps them. And then what I would love to do the second time, once they think that this is just too, okay, I'm, I'm ready for the next. This is where I would take a lot of this. I do take it myself and then I break it apart and I allow them to actually, just like we've done old school style face-to-face, -face, they have to actually put it in order. So they're looking at the pattern and they're trying to put the pattern together. And then they're responsible to either type it or write because that is a neuroscience issue of the cognitive and understanding that they actually put pen to paper or typing to their brain to see this, to recognize. And then we start doing the oral aspect of it. And I love doing that where I record myself reading, the students record themselves reading. They could do it visually where they're recording almost like they're making their own little YouTube, but don't put it on YouTube. Um, and then they also have just doing the audio where they're just speaking into the phone and then you save that into your digital portfolio. These are all ways in which you have to think outside the box, even though you're saying, well, I don't know if I can do that. You've got to take you've got to take the one method that you could say, okay, trial and error with kids. Just as language acquisition is trial and error, so are teaching our kids. And it's okay. You're gonna see what works, but know that you have these out these other options for you to do it. But for level B, I would be doing the guided reading. They would be working. I'd put the cat the, the dot camera on here, which is great. Now, some people have been asking about recordings. Yes, if you are using it with just your class, just your class, okay? So I use the kick method, K-I-C-K, -K, keep it in class and kids, K-I-C-K, -K, kick, keep in class and with kids, right? So the kick method is just simply, I'm gonna keep this stuff, I'm gonna make my recordings, and when I'm done, that's it. I can have this just for the kids. And that's important because we are talking about a company, even though you bought it, you wanna know that they're being kind to say you can do this, because we understand the circumstances right now, but the digital one is awesome too. So if you purchase the digital, like some of you did in Texas, great job because that can assist as well. We have to think outside the box for our kids. And I do love reading to them, recording it. And then the kids do the same back to me in Flipgrid in separate sections and answer the guided reading questions. And then for level C, they're required just to read it as a group, um, the narrator, the characters for fiction, and then with non Nonfiction, they're actually reporting it as if they're BBC America. So I call it BBC America and the kids all have to, sometimes they wear hats like they're old reporters from the 50s and they make recordings of themselves discussing it as if they know it's a factual thing. So it's very interesting. Some kids even act them out in schools and they actually go to different places and do their own videos to it. It's quite powerful. So there's other ways besides just reading it to make them understand it. And we've got to think outside the box for that to make it fun. Definitely. Thank you. Yes, Jody says, even our best readers love to be read to, especially teenagers, 100%. Amen. Yes. Okay. So we have read the book. We have engaged with the text now with all of our students. Now what? There's There are things that the students can produce as a result of engaging with this text. Again, in the teacher's guide, you have these student activities ready to go, which are going to be um, probably best appropriate for your level B about, right? About, every class is different. So here's an example of a student activity that is in the teacher's guide. This one is for the fiction title, Bus 17. This one might be a good, uh, a good one for your level B, but we've got to adjust it for our level A and level C. So what do we do for our level A students, Darina? We've got, uh, 
this uh, who, what, where slide coming right up for you. All right, sounds good. And that's one of the biggest parts with my level A kiddos It's the first thing that's ever come out of their mouth besides my name is, is just who, what, when, where, excuse me, in this order, who, where, what, why, and when. Because if you look at the standard of what they're learning, the main character, a setting or place, a main idea, reasons that support, and then time. So that's also part of setting in place. So this is brilliant for us to actually just say who, that's all I want to know. Who's the main character? And this would be for the nonfiction one. But if you want to say who's the main character in the non or who is the person that we're discussing, you could say the principal, the counselor. You can name them instead of main characters, just say who are people in the nonfiction article or nonfiction book. The setting and the place. This is the perfect. If they can master this at the end of the book, imagine you've still got how many books? 17, 15, how many books do we have in the whole set list that are nonfiction and fiction? 14 and 14, so 28 right. total, yep. So imagine newcomer interrupted education, our slight babies 14 times are going who, what, who, where, what, why, and when of each of the characters, they are mastering all five things by the end of that and are able to see it in varying aspects of um, articles and poems and other things that we'll eventually get to. Now this would be a, just a sample of an idea for what you would do for the, and I only did the five, but there's a whole bunch of pictures that you would put together. But you can see that those pictures were taken from the digital part of Saddleback. And that's important for you to know, and it's not to be reproduced, it's to be used the kick method with your kids, okay? And then we'd go to level B, which of course we already knew is the handout. And some people say, oh my God, this is old school. We're getting dittos and handouts. Yes, yes. In this time right now, yes, that's what we're supposed to be doing. This is the level B, they figured that out. Well, I'm done, Missy, this was easy. Great, go back to the next, the one before, level, the level A, Liz. And when you have level A, oh, you finished level B? Great, you're gonna do level A now. You're going to do what? It's a flea map according to thinking maps. You're going to organize and retell the story and you're welcome to do it in heritage language level Ayers. You can also do it level Bers, but be ready to retell this story by the intro is the top, then the three major ideas of that nonfiction story, perhaps details at the bottom, and then the conclusion. We'll have already guided. I would have done a cheat sheet for this for students to copy with sentence framing, and it is very powerful. So when the Bers do their asynchronous learning online and they think they're done, <laughs> give them a little bit of number two for level A and they're gonna be quite busy and they're gonna feel so great. And then we go to level C, right, Liz? This is the fun That's one. That's right, here's level C. We get into some of that plot action there. And this is great. Now you're saying, well, where does this come from? Of course, they have to do B first. They have to do the ditto first for their work to prove that they're ready for this. And what I did was to show them in this particular, and this is an actual program. This is a one, these are all lessons that are in this that I created for a district. And it says, using the fiction book we read, complete the diagram. Well, if they don't remember, then they have to go research how to do it. And I don't care what language they use to figure out what this conflict, climax, rising action, this is taught in many different places and they can research this anywhere. Study.com did a great job and it can be done in, in, in heritage languages specific. Sometimes it's a little difficult because the language is not available, but there's also younger versions that kids feel comfortable with when they tell fables and stories and Disney stories and whatever research they wanna do technologically to find out how to fill this out it is really complex, but it's not, for, but they can really do their own research and their own learning. And then I conference with all the kids in level C and how they're doing. And they wind up having a really big discussion about this, how to fill it out, and then how to turn all of this into an oral defense. Can you tell I'm getting my doctorate, an oral defense, and to also do a written piece. So we just are at the beginning stages. We haven't even gotten to the writing and the oral aspect of this, but we're doing a lot of it, like talking it out a little bit and then doing this, but then to do an actual essay that comes out of this, whew, we throw in the writing recipe and forget it. We are just on fire. So this is how we differentiate. You do have to think a little bit on your own students. You might not have three levels, but this is how you would think about it, right, Liz? That's right. And then finally we have, um, 
Very importantly, in the teacher's guide, we do provide you with a quiz. And now we're going to transition the conversation a little bit to um, assessment. Um, so yes, we do provide you with a quiz, but if you're going to differentiate everything else, you should probably differentiate your assessment as well. So once again, the quiz that's available in the teacher's guide for you, ready to go, probably appropriate for a, a level B or some, some level in your class, and you're going to have to make some adjustment for others. So let's take a look at what a level A assessment might look like. So as Liz was saying, just to reiterate, that's B. That is a typical old school quiz and there's nothing wrong with that, okay? Because someone said, thank you for validating that you have to go old school sometimes. W Listen, you have to do what you have to do. And if the student is learning and you know yourself, if, if, if all right, you know, they could do more than that. I know I got to push them a little more. They did this one. All of them got a 100. I'm happy for them, but I can see it might just be a little too easy for them. I'm going to bring it up a little bit in a notch for something else to add to it. Let's do a writing piece. Let's do an open ended response. Get them thinking. Let's do a formative assessment on top of the summative assessment by them really summarizing in a Socratic circle or a philosophical chair. And that you can also do those digitally. Oh, I could talk to you guys for hours. I'm loving this. <laughs> Here's level A. This is just a sample of what the whole big thing looks like, but look what I did. I took the actual vocabulary word. I took the picture that matches the vocabulary word. So as you can see right there, there's three different things and then they would have to match what the picture is that goes with the word. And then what they did is they have to take their notes from what they see. They take their thinking maps that they did about describing the people and they put that all together to help answer some of the sentence frames that would also be part of them. And that goes into their portfolio. Are they doing the same thing as the other students? Yes, it's just more visual. But are they still learning the same vocabulary? Yes. Is it the same standards? Yes, because we wanna make sure it's equitable. And when they feel good, do you know what happened to the kids who did this? They turned around and said, Missy, do you think maybe next week and for the next story, I could start on level B? What? That's called intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic is this. This is extrinsic. Extrinsic motivation. And this is intrinsic motivation where it starts with your heart. And they want to do intrinsic motivation to get themselves to the next levels. It could not be something better. That's why differentiation works. And then we go to C. Don't forget, level B is what's in the book. I put this in here just so, just to drive that point home. Level B is what's in the book. Level C, here you go. Beautiful. So here's level C, and you can differentiate this all you want. They have to complete level B in order for them to get to level C. I'm not going to read that. You could read that on your own, but there's freedom. There is freedom. They have to make a quiz, and guess who gets to take the quiz? level B. And you see what we're doing? We're getting level C to truly understand all the information by creating different types of ways in which they can assess themselves. And then we're going to give those assessments to the other kids. Guess what level B does? Missy, can we do that next week? On the next, do really well here on the next book that we read? Absolutely. You guys will be doing that and level C will be doing yours. I love it. Let's do it. And it's okay to call them those different levels because the kids know that language is a progression. And as long as we teach them and realize that and we honor that and honor the mistakes, the kids are going to feel so good and have that intrinsic motivation to want to get to the project-based learning of the quiz making. And you, you should see some of these quizzes. We, I, I gave them to some of the teachers because they were so good to be using in the future. The kids loved it and the creativity was so much fun, but I gave them the autonomy. And if they want to work with a partner, absolutely, but they have to present the material to me individually as I conference with them once I look at their portfolios, which we'll get to in a second. Yes, Liz? and we're, we're going to move it along because we're running short on time here, but it's important to note that if you're doing this, your students are generating a lot of material that then you can put together nicely for a nice portfolio. And assessing with portfolios is, is just really effective to, to of course, um, observe progress over time. And so as the students are completing these various differentiated activities, collecting them um, in a portfolio, very valuable. Why is that, Darina? 
it's very valuable for what you said for the progression, but the kids get to see it. And I usually do this old school in little white binders where every kid has their academic portfolios where the standard is there. Did they master the standard? They have to sign off on it. I have to sign off on it every time a standard is done and mastered. If they didn't, I know I have to reflect on my own practice. And the other part is you put this together, you can get this and take it to your meetings. You can send it if it's digitally, um, you can take it to the next class, to the next level. And my favorite part is when you have content area teachers, and again, innocently ignorant or arrogantly ignorant that the, this kid isn't working in my class, show them what you have and say, here's their portfolio. This is what they have the capacity to do. I line this up with my, let's say you're a WIDA state, my WIDA standards and my dis performance descriptors and look what these kids can do. Maybe you could look at this as a guide and perhaps I can help you as the ELL teacher with your content to differentiate and accommodate and modify for your ELL because look at what they can do. Oh, I didn't know they could do that. Look at what we're doing, advocating for our students because of their academics and the proof is in the paper, their portfolio, right Liz? Perfect, perfect. Thank you for elaborating on that. Okay, and we want to kind of wrap this all up with just going back in um, hitting some of these points about teaching remotely. As we were going throughout our conversation today, Darina was sprinkling in these ideas for uh, Jamboard and the, these ideas for um, what to do with the with the cards and, and the books and how to read and show the books and that sort of thing. But we just wanted to come back one more time and sort of drive some of these points home about if you're if you are teaching remotely, what are some key takeaways, some key practices, Darina? One of the things I, I really recommend is um, if you are on Twitter, Irina McGrath and Michelle Story are phenomenal tech gurus for ELL. And I, I have never been blown away by somebody in my life, but Esther Park, she is an, a phenomenal digital girl, uh, teacher, excuse me, a digital uh, educator who just does amazing things. And these people can really inspire you to take all of this information and do it in Google Meet, do it in Google Slides, uh, to do it just wonderful ways in which you can be, but you have to follow those guides as well. Um, the other again is the word walls digitally that will be behind you at all times, putting digital word walls on Jamboard, interacting with Jamboard. Kids love the Jamboard. There's so much, um, there's wonderful ideas for sketch noting, and uh, Valentina Gonzalez is a wonderful person with sketch noting, and you can put sketch noting with where um, you have, instead of just those pictures, if students are artists, they can do a sketch note, they watch the video on how to sketch note, and then they create the vocabulary and what they learned in the story doing a sketch note. These are all different ways that you can differentiate this instruction for the kids. Again, we talked about um, the read aloud, there is fillable teacher guides for the digital. Um, and then if you have any questions with the digital part, you would talk to Liz. And then the reading aloud, we talked about that already, Kick method, keep it in the class with the kids. Kick method means do this, record it, absolutely, but this must stay within your classroom only because Saddleback is saying, hey, listen, you know, this is this is ours and we're letting you do this because this is staying within your kids and we want what's best for children during these unprecedented times. And that's why I'm so dedicated. To, I don't I don't work for Saddleback. I'm just a teacher and a consultant who goes out to different places using Saddleback, but I love Saddleback that much and what they stand for to advocate for our kids. That's why I decided to do this webinar with Liz. And those are all the different ways in which we can do these wonderful books. So what do you, you have anything to add with that, Liz? Just thank you so much for reiterating that. And if you own these materials and uh, you are teaching remotely and your students don't have the books, uh, reading to the students out loud synchronously, making a recording, um, that's okay as long as you keep it within your class, right? We, we don't want to end up distributing these materials to people who didn't buy them, then we're getting, then someone's getting into trouble. We don't, we don't want that. So, uh, but if, if you bought these, if your district bought them, uh, we want you to be able to, to use them 100%. So um, we, if, any questions about that specifically, please contact me and, and I'm happy to walk you through that. So, okay, we are going long. P a few people are hanging in there with us, even though this we've gone a little bit longer than we normally do, but this is really the, the bulk of it. So we wanna circle back and take some questions because we did get a couple of questions that come in. Uh, here's some contact information. Um, 
any more uh, detailed questions for how Darina has done this with her students, you can contact her, uh, darinasackman.com. She's uh, at Darina underscore believe on uh, Twitter as well. So um, definitely do not hesitate to, to reach out to her. And you can reach out to me, Liz at sdlback.com. Um, but you know, we're a small company, so uh, you reach out to, to anybody in Saddleback and they will direct you to me. We will find each other and I'll be able to, to help you out. So let's talk about what's coming up next week. Next week, we have Teresa Wills and she is um, a distance learning guru, in my opinion. Uh, uh, Esther, you mentioned, um, um, Darina, you mentioned Esther earlier. Uh, Esther, shared a little secret with me that she learned a lot of her tips and tricks from uh, Dr. Wills here. So oh. yes, so I was like, great, let me give her a call and see if she can come and, and talk to us. So she is, uh, in fact, we, we were hoping to have uh, Esther on again as well, but um, it's, a, it's a busy time of year. So, um, you know, what, but Teresa Wills will, will be here and she's going to talk to us about increasing that collaboration when you're teaching from a distance. And um, we really hope you're able to join us for that. Uh, sign up on our website or uh, you'll be receiving an email prompting you to register as well. Okay, let's get to these questions. Let me pop open this Q&A window. So um, there were a couple of questions about the levels and how do you assess to know who's in level A, B, and C? Any, any sort of general guidance on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the first thing that you would do, of course, is always look at whatever is done from their their QM folders and their portfolios, um, what they did on their, uh, you know, if they did access, if they did TELPAs, ELPAs, whatever test that they did and how that matches up with perhaps if you're a WIDA state, where they are in levels. Um, I gauge that a little bit, but as newcomer newcomers that did not have any tests, I actually do a, a simple a formative assessment to know. It's a get to know you immediately when they come in. They have to fill it out and I watch them. Uh, do they know how to manipulate a pencil? Do they know how to answer the questions? Are they really just filling in the bubbles? Are they doing it? Are they using computers? Are they using their phone and technology easy? Are they quickly translating? Is there strength in their L1? I interview them, see how they are. I get to know them. And then I also do reading, writing, speaking, speaking and listening first before I even jump into this by taking one of the books and ask them to just simply straight up read. I don't need them to know about the comprehension of the word. I want to be able to see the flow and that's important. Now, students who have never seen Roman letters, that's a little bit different. And we do want to make sure that they give something in their heritage language. And if they're flowing with it easily, that also helps. I'm a huge proponent of Microsoft Translate over, micro, of, over Google. And I also use that as well for students to do the written aspect of it. And if we see students have the ability to manipulate technology and writing and the way that they interact with you, you and their in interviews with them, you know, that's how I gauge where they are. And a lot of times after I put them in those specific places without that, you know, big assessment, I actually will see from the kids, Missy, nah, I, I want to be in B. I want to be in C. And there are some kids that choose the easy route and go to A and I already know. So they go up to C. So you gauge it in a way. And if anybody would like a sample of what it looks like for me to do those introductory assessments for the students, it's a little old school but it gets exactly where I need to go. And if my kids made 62 to 78% learning gains, I think it worked. So that I definitely contact me for that as well. Yes. And the next question is, um, can we receive the lesson plan that, that you created for this? And um, definitely for any of these resources, the assessment resources that Darina just mentioned, and like the lesson skeleton, uh, you'll want to contact Darina for that. Uh, DarinaSackman.com is her website, and you can reach her uh, through the website for sure. And then there's another question here. Are the levels A, B, and C in the teacher's manual? If not, where, where do we get those levels? So the teacher's guide will provide you with essentially what is level B. Um, and then you will differentiate to create your own level A and your own level C based upon the levels that you have in your classroom. Um, so my level A might be different from your level A, just depending on different language proficiencies uh, and the sort of continuum of language development that you have present in your classroom. So um, for the sample of what Darina has done, um, you can reach out to her and that will get you, get you started on that. Anything to add to that, Darina? 
yeah, you might just have all level A's. <laughs> you might not have level B and C, or you might B might be too difficult for all your newcomer babies. So you have to drop to your own created A by using level B to differentiate and get them eventually to B. You might not have seers, but in my experiences, there have been quite a differentiated and wonderful group of, of kids linguistically that you would have A, B, and C. And even students who have absolutely no English yet, the power of yet, they still had such a strong L1 that I placed them in B. And there are some that had even stronger that I placed in C. And that is something you also have to take into consideration. Not being able to speak English yet does not necessarily mean that they could not be in level B or C. It just, level A a lot of times is for that true differentiated instruction for the SIFE, the SLIFE, and interrupted education. But I would start all kids at B and go to A or go to C. And then if the kids are higher than C, you might want to consider them to be in a mainstream class with a lot of support from a paraeducator. <laughs> awesome. Excellent. Thank you, Darina, and thank you to all of those of you who, who joined us live today. And uh, we, oh, thank you. You're welcome, Pamela. <laughs> I just I just love everybody Hi, who Pamela. comes to. <laughs> okay, well, and with that, uh, we hope to see everybody next week for Teresa Wills, who's got a lot of great practical tips and templates and sort of ready to go things for you to implement for distance learning. Uh, I think you'll definitely get a lot out of that. So please join us next week as well. And thank you, of course, to Darina for sharing all of this fantastic material and ideas for how this uh, can work and how it looks in a classroom with English learners. We, we so appreciate your time. And of course, you're a fan favorite. So you're welcome back uh, any anytime. Uh, you can find Saddleback on all the social media platforms. Pick your favorite. We are there. In fact, our webinars um, are on our YouTube channel. So go ahead and check out all of our previous webinars on the YouTube channel. Twitter, of course, is a big, win, a big one. Instagram, we're on all of them. So please find us there. And thank you to everybody so much for what you do um, for, for students every day. We know it's, um, it's, been, it's been a hard few months, and, uh, but you're, you're, still, you're still standing. And uh, we just are so grateful to get uh, an opportunity to, to support you. So thank you so much. And thank you, Darina. And we'll see everybody next week. Take care. Bye.